Hi, we're the Ten Tenors, and you're watching Noise Eleven. And it's great to welcome back the Ten Tenors, and uh, well, we've got a new guy in the band. What's happening here, Graham? We've uh, added uh, added somebody along the way. No, it's um, you know Mission Impossible where they remove the uh, the mask at yeah. the end. We're actually all the same blokes. Yeah, uh, we've just replaced it with a different. Face. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. each, each two will reveal a new face. Underneath. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Like yeah. The yeah. yeah, but not everyone. So it's just sort of random and random, just numerically. Even. Keep audiences on their toes. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. like maybe two people will be different each year, maybe five. Yeah, yeah. really. Just and they saw my face and they said they can't improve on this. They did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, uh, Jared, you're the new guy. Yes. Yeah, here we are. Tell us yeah. about your audition. What they put you through. What was the initiation like? Uh, you know, Gladiators. Remember that show? <laughs> then we had. Uh, yeah. I don't think I want to hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> He's just talking about what we wore. Yeah. 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 We love All these guys standing down the gauntlet with like padded uh, rods. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Padded um, good. <laughs> no, look, it was um, it was kind of ex uh, over extended period of time. There was three or four auditions, starting with kind of a send in your audition tape. Um, and uh, see what you can do, and then a couple more stages, and then I flew up to Brisbane to um, audition for Graham, our, um, our music director, and uh, yeah, just kind of waited and waited and waited, and eventually, um, yeah, I was given the go-ahead, and I've been up and rehearsed with these guys in Brisbane, um, and uh, this week is my big debut. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Or day butt, as just came out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. and there'll be more like that. To <laughs> so don't go away, folks. We'll be back after the next gag. All right, well, let's talk about uh, a little something called uh, double platinum here, oh, which wow. is a two CD set uh, that is half rock and half opera. Hmm. So you know you've really divided what. Uh, Ten Tenders has always been about on a single album before this time round. And we've literally divided it, um, as you said, it's half rock, half classical, but there's a rock disc and then a classical disc. Um, and I guess it's sort of been um, the process of a, of a show that we started in 2010, which is the Power of Ten show, uh, which we never made the record of. And then we sort of got to the point, the show was so successful, we toured it all around the world. It was the first time we'd done a show without making a record first. Um, so we got the chance to road test all the material and we worked out sort of what what the sort of the split was that sort of worked for the group and then we put it onto a record. Mm. And I think I, I, I can speak for all of us that it's it's definitely the record of which we are the, the most proud because it's probably the record that we've had the most personal involvement in um, in terms of producing it and being involved with the arrangements and even sort of the, the, the vibe of, of the stuff that's on the actual project. So, yeah, yeah we're really happy with it. So in, in, in picking the songs, uh, well, for a start, there's two Queen tracks mm -hmm. on this record. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they just lend them... The Queen sound lends itself so well to the sort of the sound that we try and bring mm. to the music. There's such heavily stacked harmonies that, that, you know, I think we've mentioned it before, we're very lucky in the sense that we can have the sort of soloistic specificity of we're not too big so it's not like a choir where just everyone becomes faceless but we can also have the harmonic sort of size and scale of of a choir as well so we do stretch that middle ground and queen fits perfectly into that mm. yeah it's great and you've got the rock god in the band uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> metal <laughs> <laughs> yeah. tell me about your uh, alter ego sure Yes, my alter ego is my metal band, Ashes of Corruption. And our album is USSA, Bite on iTunes. Um, <laughs> I, I've always, uh, yeah, I've, I guess what first ever got me into music was, was hard rock and heavy metal. Mm -hmm. um, how I got into opera, I have no idea, but I do, I do love um, singing with the guys. And I guess over the years, learning, you know, uh, learning lots of stuff through recording, um, through touring and writing songs, arranging, um, I, I decided to do the one thing I've always wanted to do, which was create a, a metal album. Mm -hmm. And I did that and... Uh, yeah, I'm going to have fun sort of punting it around and um, already started working the new one, so right. it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there seems to be a, a real crossover between metal and opera anyway, doesn't there? You know, uh, well, like absolutely. Even, yeah. even, you know, you look at somebody like a Russell Watson, Russell will go and cover a lot of metal mm. songs as well. It's becoming a big thing these days, people, you know, um, people stretching themselves and, and, their, and their limits to what they what they do and, and, and breaking the mould, um, and lots of lots of groups are doing, like, we, we started it really way back in the day when we started covering sort of tunes that people 
wouldn't think the ten tennis would do like you know Bee Gees and and Simon and Garfunkel and stuff like that. So I think it's it's going to be ever increasing all the time with artists um, going out of their comfort zone and trying different material. And it's great. It, it really sounds good. Mm. Mm. Now what about disc two on here where we're getting to the more traditional you know opera songs? Um, you, you know you've you've been around for it must be coming up to a decade now. Uh, it must be getting harder and harder and harder to find songs to choose for a ten tennis record. Yes and no, I guess. I mean, some of the of the uh, of the nine pe- or eight or nine pieces that are on the back, I can't even remember. Um, <laughs> of, of the pieces that are on the back, I think only two are, f- are sort of would be considered truly classical pieces in terms of what songs would be in the canon of, say, Placido Domingo or Pavarotti when he was still around, or you know, opera singers. Would it be in their palette of repertoire? There's probably only two or three songs that would be, and then there's a couple of songs from musical theatre. There's a couple of classical crossover songs, um, and there's a couple of sort of like there's a, there's the great song Miserere, which is written by Zucchero, um, with which he did a duet with Pavarotti, um, which is pretty much a pop song, but we just thought we'd tack it onto the classical thing because we ran out of ideas. It's in Italian. Yeah. Never already did it. Let's just chuck it on the end. Some violins um, in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like track five, so it's hit and right in the middle of the play. Um, well, so now, now, now we know their formula. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I guess this, what we were really conscious of was, was even though the two sort of worlds from which the songs are derived are so apparently disparate you know to have Ness and Dormer and Bohemian Rhapsody on the same record seems like this weird juxtaposition in actual fact we were very conscious when we were doing it in the studio not to make um, too much of a sort of departure from our sound so we kept the sort of the vocal sound is always the same across across the whole album and even the sort of the way that we've arranged and orchestrated the way that we've produced it the sound of the whole record is sort of the same so so what we've tried to do is take pieces of, of material from all over the, the musical spectrum, but then narrow it down to what we consider to be the, the ten tenors sound, I guess. Mm. Well, I guess a song like Bohemian Rhapsody is very mm. operatic yeah, anyway. Yeah. In fact, it even came from an al- album called The Night of the Opera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Meatloaf is a very operatic Yeah, rock opera well. and stuff like that. So, mm. yeah, I mean, we um, again, the flip side of that is that when we were choosing the rock material, you, you're exactly right, we did choose material that lent itself to not being operified because we don't sing operatically when we do the rock stuff. We sing with a sort of, uh, we're always talking about um, uh, classical technique with contemporary choices. So we mm. still use the classical technique, but instead of doing like bel canto line, we, we use contemporary choices like straight tone or different kind of vibrato. We put a bit of gravel in the voice or whatever it is. Mm. So it's the, it's the contemporary sensibilities with a classical approach. Mm. Yeah. Are the 10 tenors still doing 250 shows a year? Or is it still that intense? Yeah, really. Yeah, we're, yeah, absolutely. We're on the road this this year already. We've uh, we've covered like four continents, and and we're just playing through. We haven't really had much of a break. We did the album, which was our little break from touring. But yeah, we've just go go go, and yeah. and and loving it. Just letting everyone see this great. Yeah, event. that's our definition of a break: going into a studio for three weeks and seeing, <laughs> yeah. seeing twelve hours a day. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> our break. That's our holiday. I was I was thinking you're on the road so much that half the I had to go and check to see if the album was recorded in the Qantas Club. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think actually you touched on something there. The, the best thing about the record, I think, was that we put down the vocals in, in Brisbane. The orchestra was recorded in Prague. Mm-hmm. The, uh, we also did some vocals in New Zealand. Uh, the bass was recorded in Dallas. The drums were recorded in Oslo. The piano was recorded in London. And it was produced in Brisbane by myself and a couple of other guys. And then... Um, it was produced in Newcastle and London. So it was produced in like eight different cities. <laughs> this incredible international hmm. effort. Unbelievable. Yeah. And we'll look back on it now and go, how the hell did we pull mm. that off? Mm. Because it was so difficult, or apparently so logistically difficult, but it just seemed to flow really easily. But I thought that was a really cool thing and a really good testament to, I guess, what we've been able to achieve in the last sort of 15, 16 years, becoming an international project and yeah we have our roots in Australia but it's amazing to have actually been able to bring in you know Europe and America as well as sort of our key markets that we tour overseas and yeah. it's great to, for that impact and that legacy to be on, on the record as well. Well you're getting to see a lot of the world, um, you know Boyd you were talking about the uh, the time in Spain before. Yeah uh, we started by saying that um, it feels like we perpetually follow winter around, we're kind of <laughs> in the northern hemisphere for you know beginning of the year and then down here for the middle of the year but we had an awesome tour last year where we got to go all around Scandinavia and do amazing outdoor concerts in, that looked over oceans and in mm. amazing quarries. And then we finished up 
on the night of the FIFA World Cup final in Marbella, which is in the south of Spain, and we were on on the beach with 10,000 crazy Spaniards. <laughs> so we're very happy when Spain won against the Netherlands that year, and honestly, it's the most amazing street party I've ever seen in my life. It didn't stop. Mm. Not all. not so amazing waiting for a taxi four hours later. <laughs> <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> but we walked home. <laughs> Where's home the most Madrid? Yeah. <laughs> Where's the most unusual place this span has been taken? Probably a basketball court uh, in Mexico. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that was falling apart, so they put <clears throat> giant big bits of white gaff tape on the sections you couldn't walk on because you'd fall through it. Yeah. Um, which was difficult because I was sort of spotted all over the place. And the best thing was that they'd forgot to um, they forgot to organise a drum kit, so at the last minute they managed to wrangle a drum kit from a local metal band called the Cadavers. Oh. <laughs> and so there's this crappy drum kit held together by chicken wire on the stage, and our drummer was having a hard time. But uh, oh. yeah, we just had to watch out for falling through the stage and dying. But yes. that was a good gig. Yeah. Our, our bass player at that gig, um, he had this very unusual looking bass that had nylon strings. And I've never seen a double bass yeah. with nylon strings before that was about that tall. I was <laughs> but I said to him, I was like, Bella, what's going on with your bass? And he's a Hungarian. And, and he goes, This was not a bass. <laughs> this, this was furniture. <laughs> <laughs> but it was made out of balsa wood. So in the middle of Bohemian Rhapsody, he's put his electric bass down and he's got the balsa wood double bass and he's moshing out with it like this, <laughs> holding it up in the air, waving. Uh, <laughs> this big double bass in the background. Yeah, it was a weird gig. Pretty incredible. Uh, the song Hey Jude, I wanted to ask you about that one. The, mm. You know, like a Beatles song for a start, but uh, you know, how did Hey Jude come about? Um, we'd always wanted to do a Beatles track, I guess, and we'd never found one that that sort of lent itself to, to our group, and we, we were always very, very reticent to attack it. Um, and I guess the working title for this record was Stadium Classics and then we were never going to call the album that but when we started coming up with the idea that was the sort of the, uh, the, the concept you know what songs could you do in a stadium in front of 60,000 people is the, the you know the, the lighters in the, in the crowd moment and so when we were looking at that one day I remember we were having a conversation there was like a five way Skype between myself and Stephen Baker, who, who produced the record with myself, and then Simon Franklin, who's done our records before, who's sort of executive producer and DJ, and then uh, Chendry, who's a guy who was doing stuff in Dallas. Um, the five of us were on Skype, and we were just bouncing ideas back and forth between each other, and then I think it was Stephen said, oh, what about Hey Jude? And we all just went, why have we not thought of that before? <laughs> like, it just seems so perfect yeah. with that whole big epic chorus at the end that you can do so much with. It's just got a hook that everybody knows. It's a great show closer. We've been, you know, the guys have been closing the show with it in New Zealand for the last month, or a month and a half or whatever it's been. Um, and it's just, it's one of those things that you sort of, you wonder why you've missed it for the last 15 years. Why was that not when the guys first started 15 years ago doing like Blame It On The Boogie and The Bee Gees and, and Sir Duke by Stevie? Yeah. Why was Hey Jude not at the top of that list? Because it seems to be such an obvious choice and we just always stayed away from it. And then when we heard the arrangement of it for the record, we just went, oh yeah, absolutely. And it's actually on the record, the first time a female has ever sung on a 10 record, we had four girls doing backing vocals with us in the booth. Oh right, so, who, who are they? I don't know. <laughs> Four anonymous women. Four uncredited ladies who are wonderful. And if you're watching this, I like you. Steph, Amy, Amy no. Rachel, and Monique. Geraldine. Monique. Yeah. 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 Barbara. And by the, by the way, too, when you see the show and, and come out afterwards, because we always go out and sign autographs and say good day. Don't tell us that your name is Jude because we didn't sing it for you. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> we, just don't care. Yeah, we don't we don't look down like the audience manifest and go, oh, there's someone called Jude in row G. We should make sure that we direct it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it was actually about Julian, wasn't it? it was Julian well, Lennon. yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. A, there's a whole load of stuff um, in the middle. There's all these sort of like urban myths because there's things that you can hear on the original record that that are sort of intangible and mixed really far in the back and there's all these sort of urban myths about what they're saying what happened there's a great story I've always thought that the that Ringo's first fill was late mm. and this is one story that I do know uh, during their first cut of that which of which they ended up using the vast majority of it the first real cut they'd rehearsed it all Ringo left and went to the toilet um, and they'd started playing Hey Jude Paul started with the piano started doing the vocal 
and Ringo, and you can actually hear it. If you listen to like the first verse, you can hear sort of sticks being kicked and it's Ringo running back from the toilet <laughs> and he actually gets to the kit like half a second late. So he's actually playing it. Boom, 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 Like doing it, these ones. So you can hear it. And I've always wondered why that was like, and then researching the song, I found out that, yeah, he'd just come back from the toilet. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you play the Ten Tenors version of Hey Jude backwards, it actually says, Stuart is dead, Stuart is dead. <laughs> Because <laughs> we did that whilst he was in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to hear from, uh, from the Ten Tenors, I think a, a bit of Aerosmith. Yes. And you'll, you'll find them on the album, uh, Double Platinum. <laughs> Just Ten Tenors. <laughs> bum, 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 one, two, three. I don't want to miss oh, one smile. Miss one smile. I don't thing cuz even when i dream of you the sweetest dream would never do i'd still miss you and i don't want to miss a thing i don't want to lose my eyes i don't want to fall asleep cuz i'd miss you and i don't want to miss a thing 